roar of the iron horse, the arrival of the railroad. Walter Brewster, architect and builder, foresaw the economic opportunities that the railroad could bring to Southeast. In 1848, knowing that the railroad would pass through the town, he purchased 134 acres of farmland from Gilbert Bailey. Walter Brewster then constructed passenger and freight depots for the railroad company, thus ensuring that trains would stop on his property. In 1849, the Harlem Line Railroad finally reached Southeast, connecting it to New York City and bringing everlasting change. Property prices soon rose, and Walter Brewster built many of the homes and businesses in the new community, which was soon referred to as Brewster's Station. When a second railroad, the Putnam Line, reached the town in 1881, the town of Southeast became known as the hub of the Harlem Valley. The new Putnam Line was the fastest route between New York and Boston. Local hotels such as the Brewster House, saloons, and barber shops served the travelers while carriages provided transportation to surrounding towns. Brewster's Station became an important service point for the railroad company a round table and 14 service stalls were built for the steam locomotives. About 300 men worked for the railroad, and before each shift, the men could be seen walking to work, lunch pail in hand, from their homes on North Main Street. The railroads fostered the expansion of some local industries by providing quick and cheap transportation. One of these industries, mining, had previously been hindered by the expense of transporting iron ore to the blast furnaces where steel was produced. They, they were friends, they were neighbors, or they became friends. The train became the meeting point. Like today, say, a club or, or a tavern may be a meeting point for folks. Both young and old uh, met, came and went on the train. And the train stations in Brewster were, the, were, were if you wanted to meet somebody well, in town, say, well, meet me at the train station. That was the center of activity. Well, the trains were, were dusty and dirty. The, uh, the, the engines, the old steam engines, obviously burned coal, and there was no air conditioning then. And in a hot summer day, if you wanted some air, you had to open up that window, but uh, you had to be prepared for some cinders to come in. So uh, there were actually folks that uh, had a full-time job just cleaning those trains between runs, sweeping the cinders away. One of the, one of the great things about the putt, what, what, what I became fascinated about the old Putnam Division, is the family atmosphere on the railroad where uh, th th there were people uh, that wrote poems and, and, and there was a, it was a big, it was like going to a funeral, and it was a funeral train, that last train. And uh, because the Putnam Division was known to pick you up in between stations if you lived between stations. They had birthday parties for you on the train. Commuting was not like today where you have sullen-faced people reading the uh, Wall Street Journal with a cup of coffee in their hand and no one talks. The train was a party, both coming and going into the city uh, in, in those days, up until, up until the mid-late 50s. While the Putnam Line is no longer in use, Metro North Railroad operates on the old Harlem tracks, providing essential transportation for the many Brewster residents who commute to New York City. Digging in the earth, iron mining in Southeast. Iron mining has been going on in Southeast since the late 18th century. These efforts were rather small scale as the high cost of shipping the iron ore to local blast furnaces made it economically prohibitive. From 1806 until 1837, iron was mined on Brewster Hill, slightly north of present-day Main Street. The largest and most prosperous mine in the area was the Tilly Foster Mine. During the 1870s, the owners of this mine built a narrow gauge railroad from the mine to the Harlem Line Railroad. Soon, they were shipping hundreds of tons of ore to the company blast furnaces in Lackawanna, Pennsylvania. The Tilly Foster Mine produced magnetite, a valuable high-grade, self-fluxing ore ideal for the production of steel in the newly invented Bessemer process. In 1879, at the height of production, the Tilly Foster Mine employed hundreds of workers, extracting 7,000 tons per month. 
Most of the miners who worked at the Tilly Foster mine lived in a nearby settlement. Fleeing from poverty in their native European countries, many immigrants came to the United States with the hope of making a better future for their families. During the 1870s, the Tilly Foster miners were primarily English and Irish, but in the 1880s, the majority were Italian immigrants. The owners of the Tilly Foster mine were eager to extract all the ore possible from their mine. By 1890, the method of removing ore from the mine shafts, some of which were 550 feet deep, was not producing enough ore. Therefore, they converted the mine to an open pit. At one time, the pit was the largest man-made hole in the world. Unfortunately, due to faults in the rock, the mine walls were extremely unstable, causing many rock slides and countless deaths. Finally, in 1895, there was a major collapse. The mine was declared unsafe, and the owners were forced to close the pit. And they had been undercutting a great peninsula that stuck out from the side of the mine, uh, on which a uh, derrick-like structure would haul the ore and haul the men up and down uh, with a rope uh, arrangement, like an elevator. And they had been cutting further and further into that, and suddenly the whole thing just went. And it buried, some accounts said 14 men, others say 34, you can't really know. but And one of the the tragic things were, was that uh, many of the miners, because they were from Italy, uh, large numbers of them, and their names were so unpronounceable and strange to the Yankee mine owners here, that they just gave them numbers, and they weren't even known by their names. In 1935, John N. Trainer who had a summer residence on Allview Avenue in Brewster, began collecting rocks and minerals that had been created in the cracks and fissures of the Tilly Foster Mine. Part of his collection, on loan from the New York State Museum in Albany, can be viewed at the Southeast Museum. <laughs>